Hello, hi, um, welcome to uh, Teaching for Creativity, which will be delivered by Paul Drury, and it's part of the Cambridge Global Schools Festival. My name's uh, John McNeil, and I'll be your host today. Um, first of all, I'd just like to run through a, a few um, housekeeping um, points. So you'll be able to um, see and hear Paul, um, but you will not need a microphone. There will be time for questions at the end of the session, and if you'd like to put them into the question and answer box, we would, we would greatly appreciate that. There is also a chat box and we encourage you to give feedback um, during, during the session, but we would ask that you not put links to, um, to any sort of external sources in the chat box, please. Um, at the very end of the session today, you will, um, there'll be a link posted in the chat box for your certificate of attendance. And um, don't worry too much if you miss that link because next week we'll be sending you a link to the YouTube recording of, of the session. And um, that will also include uh, another way to access your certificate of attendance. So that will be coming to you next week and you will have a chance to, uh, to get that link today as well. So now I'd just like to say a few words about Paul Drury. Um, Paul was a teacher for over 10 years. He taught um, every level, um, many different age groups. Um, and um, then he moved into the world of publishing where he researched and commissioned quite a few very successful courses. Um, Paul is particularly interested in, in creativity um, and he had the opportunity to visit hundreds of schools and interview teachers and learners and he uses that and uh, as motivation to create even better um, learning materials. Paul created the, um, the journals for Cambridge Primary Path, the uh, creativity journals, and if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about his interest in creativity, he has a, a blog um, at nurturingcreativity.org. So that's nurturingcreativity.org. So um, today, Paul is going to look at what we do in the classroom with our younger learners and how that helps prepare them for what is, as we can all see, a very uncertain world. So how do we prepare them to be adaptable and to think creatively? So that's the, the topic that Paul's going to take us through today. Um, please add your, your questions into the Q&A box. And in about half an hour, we'll have an opportunity to, to run through the questions together. So with that, I'm uh, just, uh, just about to hand over to Paul. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Let's see. Okay. Right, I'm sorry, bear with me one second. Let me just do the presentation. There we go, and we can get started. Right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, wherever you might be in this wonderful world. Thank you so much for taking the time for joining me today. As John was saying, uh, we're going to be talking about creativity. We're going to be talking about the process of creativity, in particular, in relation to young learners. And really it's about some of the things that we do in the classroom, uh, the things that we do that can help or that can sometimes hurt some of that creative process in our young learners. And the key thing, the key element to take away is that really children don't need a lot of help. All they need is the right environment. And that's some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and so let's get started. The things, this is the area that we're gonna run through. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the nature of creativity, what it is, why it's important. What are some of those key tools of creativity, some of the things that we need to be able to develop our thinking? And then I want to be looking at it from the point of view of the teacher, from our point of view in the classroom. What can we do when we're in the classroom to be supporting and encouraging that creative process? And then also I want to reflect for a couple of minutes on the influence that we might have um, for our learners in the classroom. Sometimes we think we come across one way, but in reality, we're perceived in a very different manner. So there's a few elements there that I want to juggle through in the next 30 minutes or so. But to start off, um, I think a good place to start is to think about what creativity actually is. And um, I think in the last nine months, we've all had quite a bit of reality. We've probably had too much reality. 
But there was something I was listening to on the radio a few weeks ago that got me thinking. Uh, they were talking about the fact because of the situation, because of lockdown, because of quarantine, all sorts of things, they were forced to be creative. And I thought that expression was really interesting because I think it encapsulates some of the key elements of what creativity is. Uh, we sometimes think that creativity is about, I don't know, big pictures, wonderful bits of music, wonderful bits of literature, and it is about that. Definitely, it's about those things. But there's a, there's a significant element where creativity is about putting us in a situation where we feel slightly uncomfortable, where we feel we don't really understand the process, where we are forced to be creative. And that's why we have these cliches of thinking out of the box, um, going off the beaten track, all these kinds of expressions that we have. Because there's a key point here where the brain, uh, the brain is very energy hungry. It uses a lot of energy. And therefore, what it does, it tries to be as efficient as possible. And by being efficient, what it does, it tries to conserve energy. Therefore, it uses all the synaptic connections that it's used to using time and time again. And that makes us, you know, have a perfectly normal day. But creativity only happens when we get our brains to stop and think. So, Taking that idea, um, there's obviously people study creativity for their whole careers and they spend their lives worrying about what creativity actually is. This is one definition that I like to use. Um, it's written by the team behind Ken Robinson who did a report for the UK government back in 1999. And he calls it imaginative activity fashioned to produce outcomes that are original and of value. Really, so what does that mean all it means is that we we're using our brains to have ideas that are new and interesting or new and of value so in a nutshell really it is the creative process is so much about just engaging our brain and generating ideas i think the element of being ideas that are new and of value that's perhaps where younger learners um, haven't quite developed the mental capacity to, do, to be to the criteria to evaluate creativity. That comes later. But where our focus needs to be is on that generation of ideas or creating ideas. Um, and just one little example, this um, awful picture that you see on the right is a windmill. Now, I'm kind of interested a little bit in, in the generation of um, electricity. Now, I'm not scientific. I'm, I have, do not have an engineering brain at all. But back in April, May, when we had a lot of time on our hands, I was quite interested and I watched a couple of videos on YouTube and I thought, well, I'll try and make this windmill. And I thought, uh, looking at people on, the, on, on YouTube, they do it in two minutes and it's finished. I spent that thing that you see there, it probably took me about six, seven hours, which is quite embarrassing. But because every time I thought I understood the problem, I was faced with a new problem and I had to find a way of thinking about solving that problem. So for example, how did I put the upright, the vertical into the wood to keep it straight? How did I connect the blades to the actual the vertical, the horizontal to the vertical? How did I do it so that it would be able to catch the wind and not wobble? How could I do it so that it could turn in different directions? Now, I have to say my windmill was an absolute disaster. It was a failure, but it made me very happy. I, I, I found it was, it was very, very engaging and I was confronted with thousands of little creative challenges. Um, unfortunately, the dog hated it. So in the few times when it was windy and it did go round and round, the dog went absolutely mad. But it's that thing that I think is worth retaining with us when we go through this talk. It's that element that the creative process puts us in a position of slight discomfort. It's not necessarily a warm and fluffy feeling. Now, a little challenge for you, and I'm sure you've seen something like this in the past um, already. There's um, a researcher on creativity called Boulder Onerheim, and I've got the list of references at the end of this presentation if anybody's interested. Um, and he talks about this nine dot challenge, which I'm sure is something that you've seen before. So in the next couple of minutes, while I continue talking, if you want to have a think about this, by all means, you know, have a think and try and think of different solutions. All you need to do 
is using four lines or fewer, four consecutive lines, so the lines need to touch, is that you need to find a way of making those lines join all the dots. Okay, simple as that. Drawing lines where the, to, to connect all the dots. And it's a simple challenge and there is a correct answer, but there's also lots of alternatives. And the point that Boulder Onerheim makes is that younger people are less constrained than adults. As adults, we have to, we, we, we kind of, we're more institutionalized, we're more constrained by convention. Whereas the wonderful thing about the younger learners is that they haven't got those constraints yet. We'll come back to that in a second. So, okay, here's me banging on about creativity and saying how wonderful it is and how important it is. But really, you know, is it just me saying those things? I mean, what, what is it in the outside world? Why do we need that creativity? And I, I hope I don't need to persuade anybody here today of the importance of creativity. Because every time you watch a TED talk or you read a business report or anything like that, they talk about creativity as being one of the uh, key attributes that they're looking for in, their, in people in the workplace. And there's a really interesting report that was written by the OECD uh, called Fostering Creativity and Critical Thinking. Again, there's a reference at the end of the presentation if anybody's interested. I do recommend thinking about it because they talk about creativity and critical thinking and join the two together, which I think is a very sensible thing. But really, it's become a cliche to say, but the world is changing. Um, as we've seen what has 2020 has shown us, shown us 20, we need to be ready for change. We need to be adaptable. We need to be prepared for anything. We need to, the jobs that we have today will not exist tomorrow. Now, you know, these are things that we hear every single day, but they are true. We only need to think about the way that we order our food, the way that we use GPS, the, the fact that we don't use paper maps anymore, the way that we communicate now on Zoom so much, all of these things, our lives are very much governed by the algorithm. And which is, you know, you can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. There's, there's probably a mixture of both things and it's, it's a too simplistic a question. But I think the main thing is the point that the OECD report makes is that the learners of today really need to have that differentiating factor for the future. They need to be prepared for the future. They need, in short, to be better than the algorithm. And that's really where creativity plays the part because creativity allows for flexible thinking. It makes learners ready for change. It makes learners more prepared to experiment, to generate ideas, to not be worried about making mistakes. But then all of these things are important for the business world, fine, and for the future of humanity, wonderful. But then it's also, there's an element of it being really critical for the individual as well. The creative process using your brains is a wonderful thing. And the, um, the psychologist uh, Michal Chiksan Milhai, which is a very difficult name to say, impossible to write, but he wrote a book about flow, which many of you will know. And he talks about this, this, the fact that when you are totally engaged, when you're absorbed in a single act, when nothing else matters, that's when you are find moments of happiness, moments of self-fulfillment. So creativity also has definitely has extrinsic, extrinsic value for, for society, but it also has an intrinsic importance for the individual. Now, coming back to the nine dots. Okay, I don't know if you've had a chance with me um, talking all the time, whether you've had a chance to think about it, but possible solutions. I'm sure if we had a little bit more time, you could tell me a thousand different ways of, of solving this problem. The solution he talks about is this one. All he does, and the point here is that when we say you have to connect the nine dots, we automatically, as adults, or as many of us, I certainly did, I looked at those nine dots as being kind of like a box, like being a frame, like being a constraint. But the reality is, there's nothing to say that you have to stick to those nine dots. 
So simply by extending out further, you're then able to come across, down, up, and along. And that way you can connect all the nine dots. Now, it's, it's not a unique puzzle. You know, this is something that you can, it, it's in the internet, all over the internet. But I think it's a really important example of that element of constrained and unconstrained thinking. As I was saying before, the brain likes to conserve energy. The brain is really very efficient. But what the brain does in early childhood is it has, it, 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 it's using every opportunity to being exposed to learning. So the synaptic connections are everywhere. Every new thing is a new experience. Every new thing means more learning, which means that that's why you know, our younger learners are so open and embrace opportunities and are so unconstrained in their thinking. However, as they go through to adolescence and early, early adolescence, they go through a process of what's called uh, synaptic pruning, which is basically just cutting away all those neuronal connections that are used less often. So all that's left is the strong synaptic pathways. And that's what we have as adults. Because as adults, you know, we do understand the way the world works. We do understand that if we lift a pencil and drop it, it's going to fall. You know, we understand more about the world works. So we need to focus, um, restrict our, 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 our observation to be able to accept different elements of learning. But children aren't constrained by that. And the wonderful thing is, he goes on to give other uh, similar examples. He says, well, OK, one child said to him, well, you don't need four lines. You can do this in one line. And that's what he did. So who says that the line has to be a thin line? If you just have one thick line, you can connect all the dots. Unconstrained thinking. There's, um, there's and also at the end of the, uh, of the talk, there's a list of references, as I say, and there's a lady on YouTube called Simone Gertz. And what she does is she produces useless inventions, really, really ridiculous inventions. So, for example, she has one where she has uh, she's built a conveyor belt around her mouth. And on that conveyor belt, she has popcorn going round. And as the popcorn goes round, the little hand goes in and swoops in the popcorn. It's ridiculous. It doesn't work. But she does these things because she's setting herself challenges, because out of the generation of ideas, a good idea comes. So you might have 99 terrible ideas, but one good, strong idea. And what she says is, well, at least you're asking the question. And that's what our young learners do. They are asking those questions all the time. So it's our responsibility as teachers to be given all those opportunities for the learning to happen. But with this nine dot challenge as well, there's other things you could do. For example, you could just turn the paper around and so then into a circle. So then this line goes around the paper three times. The line could go around the whole of the earth three times. That would be a single line connecting all the dots. You could simply have cut out all the dots, pile up the dots, and then have one single line going through the dots vertically. There's a thousand different ways, and I'm sure you have lots of ideas as well. But it's about retaining that element of unconstrained thinking, which is so important. So we looked a little bit at the nature of creativity. Now I want to bring it into the classroom and I want to reflect on what it is that we as teachers do and, and need to do to be able to protect those elements of creativity. And um, there, there's two things. There's teaching creatively is very different from teaching for creativity. Teaching creatively is probably what we like to think we do every single day. We use, we go into the classroom, we try and make our lessons as interesting, as engaging, as motivational um, for our students as possible. And obviously, you know, we succeed with that every single day. But that's our aspiration. That's what we want to be doing. And that's certainly something that we need to retain and continue. But teaching for creativity is a little bit different. It's about allowing our learners the space to experiment allowing our learners the space to generate ideas in a safe environment without criticism. And obviously it's about also being resilient. So understanding that not everything works and that understanding that not all those hundred ideas that they generate 
not all of them will work. Okay, so that's what teaching for creativity means. In a little bit more detail, it's about giving agency for the learner. It's about the learner being more responsible for their own learning. So when you're asking questions, it's a case of making sure that they go through the process of being able to ask those questions. It's about giving the learner the space to be playful, to experiment, to have a go. It's about exploring options. Um, as with the nine dots, there is one answer, but there's also a thousand different answers. Who's to say that the answer I gave you was the best answer? I'm sure you can come up with better answers. And obviously it depends on the criteria by which you're judging that. As I said before, and I'm gonna say a thousand times during this talk, creativity, so much of creativity is simply about using your brain. It's about getting your brain to stop and think. And also an element that I think is really important that we don't really have time to talk about in great detail is this element of living with ambiguity. Because ambiguity, is a wonderful thing. And yet we spend a lot of time in the classroom trying to remove it. We try to go for A, B, black, white, right, wrong. My argument is that we should be spending a lot more time playing with ambiguity because that's what is the connect, the, learn, the knowing and the not knowing. In the middle, you have that area of ambiguity or as Piaget would call it, the disequilibrium. So that's that area that makes you feel slightly uncomfortable, where you're not quite sure, where you're just rationalizing, where you're exploring options, where you are basically in the creative process, basically learning. So ambiguity, but that's a subject for another talk. And then just one word to say about exams as well, because on the face of it, we might think, okay, well, exams, exams are very much, a, B, C, or D, is it right, is it wrong? And it's a very black and white um, process, or it can be. But the point is that creativity also plays such an important part when we are taking exams. Because it's in order to be able to have the security to answer A, B, C, or D, the learners need to be able to go through the right thought process. They need to be mentally evaluating the different options to explain their answers, to explore the different ideas and to give them the security of knowing I've been through the thought process. I've evaluated the options. I think this is the best um, answer in this context. And that's really a, a, a critical aspect of, our, of the creative process and also in the exams. Excuse me one moment. Um, so then, right, we're in the classroom. Now we're thinking about our own influence. We're thinking about what we do in the classroom. And, <coughs> excuse me, there are two things that we do, uh, how we influence our learners. There's the influence that we think we have. So when we go in the classroom, we think we're wonderful teachers, we're motivating our students, all our students are listening to us, and they're hanging on every word that we say. Maybe, sometimes. But then there's the, also the influence that we actually have. How are we perceived? How do our learners view us? I'm sure we've had this situation where you go in some days and you think, well, you know, I could say anything, nobody's listening to me. But yet a word, a look, an expression, a shrug of the shoulders, a gesture, whatever it might be, something actually hits somebody's brain. It actually works with somebody's brain and they retain it. So we never quite know what's the information our learners are going to receive. And as an example, um, just to explore the idea of what's the influence that we have. Um, there's thousands of experiments, but this is one that back in the 1970s in New York, some researchers, what they would do is they would go and stand in the middle of the street, in the middle of a busy street and just look up look up at the sky, you know, a little bit like a practical joke. Um, and after a while, other people would come up and start to look up and wonder what was going on. And then more people would come up and more people would look up and see what was going on. It's it, in, in a way, it's a very, you know, it's a very silly little experiment, but it just shows that one person standing, looking up, influences the people around us. We might not think that people notice us. We might not think that people know who we are or what we're doing, but people do pay attention. Our learners do notice 
the strangest thing sometimes though, but they are picking up on all the signals that we're sending out. Other examples of research that was carried out, um, they asked volunteers and they said to the volunteers, okay, you need to go out and talk to 10 people and you need to, for example, vandalize a book, a library book. So this was on a university. So they said to them, okay, you go and ask 10 people to write in the library book to vandalize it, which is a horrible thing to do. And they would ask the students beforehand, they would ask the volunteers and say, well, how many people do you think are going to agree to their vandalizing the book? And they would say, you know, they would estimate, I don't know, one or two people because they didn't think they had a lot of influence over other people. But in reality, I forget the numbers exactly, but in reality, it was the majority of people that they asked agreed to vandalize the book, which is a very, very surprising finding. So it's, it's the, we, the influence we have is significant. Other examples, they would go on the underground and they would ask people to give up their seat. And again, it's something that makes us feel very uncomfortable to go onto the underground and say, well, you know, can you stand up? I want to sit down. But again, the majority of people actually agreed to give up their seats, which is very strange. And then as a, on a personal anecdote, what I had years and years ago when I was uh, in the classroom with teaching adult learners and they were multinational students. And uh, we had a Vietnamese lady who came to the class and joined the class. And for the first couple of weeks, she was very quiet. She didn't wanna say anything. But then after a while, she became more comfortable and she started opening up. But when she left, she told me that in the first couple of weeks, she was terrified of me. Now, I'm, I'm many things. I'm not scary, I hope. Um, but she said that I've got this habit of saying, yep, yep, okay, yep, 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 which is in my head, I'm thinking, okay, this is a quick and easy way. I'm trying to be friendly, move the class along quickly. I'm agreeing to what the student's saying. You know, I, that was my impression. But the way she was receiving it was she thought I was saying no, no, no. And she thought I was telling everybody that they were wrong every five minutes. So there was a complete contrast in the influence that I thought I had and the influence that was actually being received by this Vietnamese student. Now, you know, I, I felt awful at the beginning, but then uh, you know, it's been a good, good experience for me, a good learning process for me. So then reach into uh, what's happening in the classroom. Bearing in mind the influence that we have, bearing in mind the subtle, the intangible nature very often of how what we do can affect our learners. Just a few things to highlight. Now, these are things that we all do, and sometimes we do them subconsciously, but maybe just by being a little bit more aware, we can be a little bit more sensitive. So for example, saying to somebody, you're wrong, telling a student all the time that they're wrong. It's like me saying in the classroom from the point of view of that Vietnamese student, no, no, no. If you cut down when somebody's generating ideas, that's the best and easiest way to cut or curb creativity. Remember for the generation of ideas, that process needs to be open and free. Afterwards, then you go through the selection and evaluation of the ideas. But similarly as well, if you're always telling the students, you're right, you're right, you're right, then it's clearly not too easy for them. They're clearly not engaging their brain. And if they're not engaging their brain, they're not thinking creatively. And then there's the, also the element of praise of being careful of the way that we praise our learners now this I, I need to be a little bit careful here because this is as as the research done by carol dweck with the growth mindset um she gives the example that children who are told she did uh, lots of tests and she, she saw that children who um were told that they were very good that they were very intelligent when they were confronted with problems that were beyond their level they were more likely to give up more quickly. On the other hand, learners who had been told that they were working very well or working very hard, they tended to persevere, to try a little bit harder. 
So I'm certainly not saying that we should not praise our students, definitely not, but just to be a little bit more aware of what message we're conveying to our learners. Maybe we can be focusing more on praising the process and less on the result, sometimes, not all the time. And then there's the element which I know I do all the time is that when I ask a question, the answer's in my head. So they have to guess what's in my head, which is, you know, it, it can be sort of demotivating. Also the aspect of um, the fact that you're being in the classroom means that the students are gonna behave differently, regardless, they're always gonna behave differently. And I thought it was really interesting this year at the French Open, the tennis, which was in October. And obviously there were no spectators in the stadium. Um, but it was really interesting because a lot of the newer, younger players did very, very well. They got to the semi-finals, I think, I can't remember. And the theory was that this was because there were no spectators, so they were feeling less pressure. So they were feeling more able to perform in the way that they felt they could. Now, you know, I've put it down as, as the bad. I think they're just things to be aware of. And they are things that we all do instinctively as well, sometimes. But focusing on the positive a bit more. I think here, the main things that we need to be encouraging and the things I've talked about already is really the generation of ideas. That's, that's something that I can't underestimate the importance of in the creative process. As I say, generate ideas, 99 out of 100 will be terrible ideas, but one will be a fantastic idea. We need to generate the ideas to find the ones that work. So for example, if you're asking questions, rather than being very quick and accepting a response, is think, well, okay, that's one answer. How many more answers can you give me? How many other alternatives can you think? Can you give me a silly answer? Can you give me a sensible answer? Can you give me from different perspectives, from different points of view? So really just to be pushing that aspect a little bit more and getting our students, again, to think. When students ask you a question, I think it's a nice idea to sometimes, again, I'm not saying all the time, maybe just to be a little bit more annoying. So rather than coming up immediately with a response, maybe throw it back to them and say, well, you know, you tell me, what do you think? And in this way, I kind of compare it a little bit to Google. Nowadays, as soon as we have a question, we type it into Google and boom, the answer springs up. Okay, and that's, that's kind of useful and it's fun and I do it all the time as well. I'm not saying that I don't, but there are opportunities where we're missing an opportunity really to encourage our learners to think through the process and to think a little bit harder. And that leads me to the final one, which is an aspect of in making our students pushing our students a little bit harder, pushing them to use their brain, to engage their brain, because creativity cannot happen if the brain is not engaged. So really by saying when a student gives an answer is to always expect more from them. So by asking, okay, and so what, why, why is that important? And, and really, really pushing them very hard. Now this is not, I'm not suggesting these are new revolutionary ideas. All I'm trying to do is highlight some of the things that are going on in our classrooms each and every day, but where there are opportunities to accentuate the creative potential of our learners. Because our learners have all the tools that they need. They don't need anything else. All they need is the right environment for their creativity to thrive. To, for those ideas to be continuously generating so that we can keep the synaptic connections building and growing each and every time. So really coming to the end now, um, I think it's just a case of refreshing ourselves. We looked a little bit at the creative process. We looked at the fact that it's, we want to be able to generate in as many ideas as possible. We, we are good at what we do, but we need our learners for the future, for their own benefit, to be um, adaptable, thoughtful, ready for anything, not afraid to have a go. Um, and that's really, what this talk has been all about is just making sure that we become more sensitized, more aware of some of the things that we do that can be helping our learners in the classroom. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Um, my email address is down there at the bottom. Um, and as I said, uh, if anybody's interested, I also have the references here, which I can make available to people if they want. Um, otherwise, I will hand you back to John, who I believe will probably have some questions.
yeah, thank you very much, Paul. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, the session, and we've got um, quite a few questions. Um, some of them might even be a, a, a may not be challenging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some of them, um, the first question um, is: There a limit to the amount of creativity provoking activities within the classroom? Would too much perhaps exhaust younger learners? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. I thought it was it was going in a different direction. Because uh, I thought it was going to be about the fact that there's lots of pressures in the classroom because obviously you have to do the curriculum, you have to finish the page, you have to do this, you have to do that. There's lots of things that we can juggle. So there's definitely um, opportunities to include the creative potential in each and every lesson. But I accept, of course, that there's lots of uh, other pressures on the teacher as well. Um, whether it's, it's too much for the students, I, I don't think it is. I think it's a case of there is an element of training. So I know it can be frustrating sometimes if you feel the teacher's not giving you the answers that you want. But I think that's also, it takes a little bit of training on the part of, of the teacher um, and the, the teacher's expectations. You, you all as teachers have routines with your students and those routines didn't happen on day one those routines took a little bit of time to embed and for the students to get used to. So I, I would argue it's exactly the same with the creative process. There is no limit. It's just a case of how much time we can squeeze in. And I would argue that it's not really a nice to have. I think it's a fundamental process of learning is the creative challenges that we face. Okay, um, I'll move on to another question. And as I do that, um, Paul, can you maybe share the um, reference slide at the same time within some requests to see it? So if you share the slide, then I'll, I'll also ask you uh, another question. And it's sort of focusing on teachers. And the question is asking that um, people often put themselves into a box of either being creative or uncreative. And how can teachers who believe themselves to be uncreative build their own creative confidence? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And I think this is, this is probably um, on a personal level. This is where my interest came, because I think it came to a certain point in my life where I started to reflect and I started to think about, well, you spend so long doing what other people tell you or what other people tell you is right. And you suddenly start to reflect and you think, well, actually, nobody really knows. Nobody's got the answers. So it, it is a case of, of we all have that creative potential. Um, and I really, my argument is that we just need to feel empowered to experiment and to have a go. So, so much of our system in the past has been about, for example, with the generation of ideas has been about, oh no, my ideas are rubbish, my ideas aren't any good. <clears throat> but we need the freedom to be able to express those ideas and that just takes a little bit of time and practice. But really don't let anybody ever tell you that you're not creative. We all have the, uh, the potential and the capacity to be creative. We just need the space to be allowed to do so and the practice. Um, I have a, another question uh, asking how much time we should give individual students um, to think before answering questions. Um, yeah, that's a good one, because I think there, there was some research I looked at from this, and I can't remember the, the, the details of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they were saying, for example, they went away and they analysed, I don't know, thousands of teacher questions. And they saw that uh, for, a higher, for a lower order thinking question, it was a case of just allowing two or three seconds um, before the student would answer. But then also if it was a higher order thinking question to allow five, six, seven, eight questions. But the, the, there is no right or wrong. I mean, you know your students. And there's also always the challenge, of course, that if you ask one student a question, then all the other students are there waiting. And there's always one student who's ready to jump in. So that, that is a bit of, um, of juggling, but it's classroom management. It's what you do each and every day. And I think it's, it's trying to allow that slight space for discomfort. And, and I'm not talking about making our students feel deliberately uncomfortable, that's certainly not but they need to be able to feel that they have to engage their brains. That might not be putting them on the spot because that's sometimes the worst thing that you can do is if you ask in front of 30 student, students a question directly to one student and they're just gonna go ah, and not want to talk to you ever again. But there are ways and means to allow that space. Maybe you allow them to write down their answers or you allow to sort of tell you in, in confidence their responses, whatever it might be. There's thousands of different techniques that you as teachers already use for other 
other in other areas. Um, we have a question about how to balance the need to grade your language with, say, A1, A1 plus learners, but also ask sort of challenging questions. Yeah, I, I, but, but I think I, I know what you mean. I know, I know it's, it's difficult in a language context, um, but I think it's, it's about what the expectations the students see. So if the students see that you're gonna be happy with the answer being A, B, C, D, black, white, then that's as far as they're gonna go. So you, you, you work with your students every day, you know what they're capable of doing. So there's always the potential to ask the question that um, even if it's just a case of saying, well, you know, do you think this is right? Or maybe you coming up with different solutions and getting them to respond to your solutions. So that it's just a case of building interaction between the students. But, um, I do understand the language limitations and I do understand the age limitations sometimes. But again, I go back to the fact that you know your students well, you know what they respond to better than anybody else. So you know where you can be pushing. And I'm not saying this needs to be done each and every lesson, 100% of the lesson, but very quickly, if you build it up over small chunks of time in, in each lesson, and you know that the students are going to, that at this point, the students, are, you will expect more from them. They will very quickly pick up on that. I've got maybe two, two more questions. <laughs> one's very short and very good, and one's very short and maybe very difficult. Um, so I start <laughs> with the easy one. Um, how do we check the level of creativity? <sighs> I, was, um, I was thinking of, of maybe frameworks. Yeah, there, there is in the report, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the NAC, no, not that one, sorry. Uh, where is it? Oh, the one at the very bottom, the fostering students' creativity and critical thinking. That goes into a quite a lot of detail on the possible framework that PISA uh, are going to be using when they come to evaluate creativity, which is something that they're planning to do in the next, I forget, next year or two. And it is exactly that about sort of evaluating that, that, that creative element. And I think it's, it's a difficult one because obviously you don't want to be grading it in the same way that you do linguistic skills. But I do appreciate that sometimes you need to be able to demonstrate that progress is happening. But there, there, there are frameworks available, I think is the easy short answer. Yeah. And now the, the, the last question, maybe one of the harder questions. Do the tests that we set as teachers in schools hinder creativity? <laughs> Ooh, that's a horrible question. <laughs> I think my, my internet connection is suddenly failing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, look, we, 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 we have in the classroom, we have so many different balls that we have to juggle. There are so many different things that we have to do. And um, I appreciate that the tests that we set are sometimes there for because the school needs them or because parents want to see the results. So there's different reasons for these things. Um, but even in the most driest and dullest of ABC black and white type of questions, you can always introduce kind of one question at the bottom, maybe which is just a little bit more left field. Um, and as a, I don't know if this is relevant, but it's just come to mind as, a, as an example from when I was at school, one of the things I always remember one test our teacher gave us. He gave us 20 questions and he said, you know, all sorts of things about English, about spelling, about maths and all the rest of it. And then question number 20 was, you do not need to answer any of the previous questions. Now, I always hated him for that, but it was a, it was a brilliant lesson. And I think it's just the fact that you can do things that are to catch the students unaware. And I think that's something that students will appreciate. So even in the dullest of tests, you can insert something just to make them kickstart their thinking. Okay, I've, I've, I've fallen foul to that trick as well. In a <laughs> um, I think that's all we have time for, just to say that um, the, uh, the certificate will be in the email that will be sent out next week, as will a recording, uh, you to, a link to the recording on YouTube. And at the top of the R, we have Arizona Muse, a supermodel and activist who will uh, help you uh, inspire your students to take action. But I just want to say a uh, great, great thank you, Paul. I thoroughly enjoyed your session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everybody. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.